here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The International Court of Justice, the UN's highest court, has found a plausible risk Israel's committing genocide in Gaza and ordered provisional measures, but stopped short of calling for an immediate ceasefire. This is the president of the court, Joan Donahue, reading out the vote of part of the ruling. By 15 votes to two, the state of Israel shall in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, in particular, a, killing members of the group, b, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, c, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Over a one-hour ruling, the International Court of Justice President Joan Donahue in The Hague quoted Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, saying that as the war got underway, Gallant had said, we have removed all restraints, we will eliminate everything, referring to Palestinians as animals. Judge Donahue continued, Gallant went on to describe Hamas as comparable to the Islamic State. After proceedings concluded today, the South African government said it welcomed the ICJ's decision. Uh, we're continuing with our guests right now, Diana Butu, Palestinian human rights attorney in Haifa, Israel, Raz Siegel, Israeli historian and professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Stockton University, joining us from Philadelphia, and Mahmoud Mamdani, professor of government at Columbia University, specializing in the study of colonialism. Diana Butu, if you can talk about um, what exactly the timetable is right now and the true level of enforcement um, that the ICJ or even the United Nations overall has. Um, go back to, using as a reference, your involvement with the 2004 decision, where the ICJ ruled the separation wall that Israel built in the occupied territories illegal. Well, let's first start with this particular case. I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, just last week, Prime Minister Netanyahu said that nothing is going to stop him, not the ICJ, not The Hague, nobody is going to stop him, and that he's going to continue to pursue ahead. And of course, the reason he's doing this is um, in part because he is genocidal, and in large part because he knows that that uh, the minute that the that his the attacks on Gaza are over, that his um, his term in office is also over because of the internal dissent inside Israel. And the reason that this is important is because it's it's I, we haven't heard yet what Israel's going what they've said, but judging by that, it means that they're going to ignore this ruling. And if they ignore this ruling, it then becomes imperative. Um, upon the member states to take this decision to the UN Security Council to have the ruling enforced at the Security Council level. And it becomes really a question of whether the United States is going to veto or abstain or what exactly it's going to do. I can tell you in terms of what happened in 2004, 2004 was a very different case. It was an advisory opinion. Uh, it wasn't a case in the, of the same type. And in 2004, Israel took the exact same position, that it wasn't going to stop the construction of the wall. In fact, it accelerated it. And uh, But part of the decision indicated that there are, there are other states, third states, other countries, that are also obliged to make sure that Israel upholds international law. And that was the part that the, where the world failed. And out of that, this is where we saw the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, ended up being recreated, reconstituted um, on the one-year anniversary of the ICJ ruling, so in 2005. And the reason that it came together was because they expected, we expected, that the world was going to come forward and do something to make sure that the advisory opinion 
was upheld and enforced, but instead they did nothing. So once again, we're going to see that, we will likely see that Israel is going to ignore this ruling. It's then imperative to take it to the UN Security Council. But all the while, it's very important that we continue the, to boycott Israel, to divest from Israel, and to push for sanctions, that the global BDS movement should be growing at this point to make sure that the age of Israeli impunity finally comes to an end. Rod Siegel, um, if you can talk about uh, the aspects of genocide, uh, you write, the crime of genocide has two elements, intention and execution. And what Joan Donahue, the head of the court, at least for another few weeks, um, read in terms of the decision for uh, what constitutes genocide. And what this means, as an Israeli historian who lives in the United States, while Israel um, tried to say this doesn't matter, the fact is they participated in this, clearly showing it matters a great deal to them, and also what it means for the United States' support for Israel and what's happening today with this court finding. Yeah, so I think that uh, it was very important that uh, uh, the court uh, um, quoted uh, some of the uh, statements uh, of intent. And it's, it's, again, important to emphasize that we're talking about dozens of statements of intent to destroy Palestinians, intent to destroy in the language of the UN Convention, uh, and by people with what's called an international law command authority, so state leaders, war cabinet ministers, senior army officers. And these statements were made over time, so not just a week or uh, two after the 7th of October Hamas-led attack, but over time. Actually, until today, when we think about what uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said on 13th of January, when he said that Israel's attack will continue, whatever happens in The Hague, he also reiterated uh, the portrayal of Palestinians uh, uh, as Nazis, for example, right, which is a, a, a basically a mechanism of dehumanization, a mechanism that uh, uh, portrays all Palestinians uh, uh, in Gaza as legitimate military targets. So these statements of intent, again, dozens of statements over time by people with command uh, authority, filled with humanizing uh, language, right, human animals, monsters, which historically we know are indicators of uh, uh, genocide. So I think it was very significant that the court um, uh, mentioned and quoted some of these uh, statements to emphasize that it's not, as uh, Israel uh, tried to argue, that it's not uh, something that we can uh, disregard, that it's actually a key element of the crime uh, of genocide, and we should be paying attention uh, uh, to this. But then it also emphasized uh, a number of times, actually, the really unprecedented scale of killing and destruction uh, on the ground, the catastrophic uh, uh, situation that Palestinians are facing now. Um, and in this, situ in this uh, uh, context, I think it's very important to say that the court basically accepted uh, South Africa's argument that Israel's quote-unquote evacuation orders are not actually, as Israel claimed, humanitarian measures, but they're actually genocidal in essence. They're, they're, that means that they are meant, which is what they did, to displace millions of people, almost two million Palestinians, well, virtually almost all the Palestinians uh, in the Gaza Strip, and under uh, 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 intensive bombings. And we know that Israel also bombed Palestinians fleeing on routes that it designated as safe. It also bombed Palestinians in the southern part of the Strip uh, early on, which it designated as safe. And of course, under the conditions of the total siege, where we today, indeed, this uh, this measure did what it was intended to do, right? It created famine, it created the spread of infectious uh, disease, uh, it created a population that has no access to clean water, has no fuel, has no medical supply. It destroyed all the, uh, all the uh, universities in Gaza, it destroyed a majority of the hospitals, it destroyed agricultural land, it targeted cultural uh, uh, sites. So everything that we know historically that happens uh, uh, in genocide, um, and with this, this a massive displacement that is now, we know that even if the Israel's attack stops now, 
many, many Palestinians will continue to die of these conditions of life, again, if to quote the convention that Israel deliberately created in order to bring about the physical destruction of the group in whole or in part. So I thought that it was very important that the ruling actually quoted and emphasized both the issues of intent and the uh, dynamics of violence and the conditions uh, um, that we see now uh, on the ground. This is very, very significant. Again, the court is saying that it, there is plausibility that Israel is likely, commit, has committed and is committing acts of genocide in Gaza. And what this means for the United States, Professor Siegel? Yeah, well, I mean, the, um, and that the, the deliverer of the message, of course, the head of the court is an American. Yeah, I think that uh, you know it's difficult. It's difficult to say, and I'm uh, you know I'm curious uh, to see how the uh, U.S. state will respond. I think that I'm very curious to see, as I said, in the next uh, few hours, I mean, beginning at noon uh, uh, today, Eastern Time, the case in California. Right, uh, uh, because now the judge there has the ICJ ruling, so the judge knows that the World Court has ruled that Israel is likely committing uh, genocide. I think that uh, um, uh, I think that there will be growing pressure uh, also on the U.S. Uh, in this sense. Um, it's it's difficult to, to to say what the U.S. will do, but we do know actually that in the in Europe there are more and more states, not not Germany. But more and more states that uh, uh, have already said and will, in various ways, need to abide uh, by the court ruling, which may be very significant in terms of obstructing arms deals, uh, refusing to facilitate transfer of arms to Israel through uh, Europe and various other measures. Uh, uh, um, you know, I think that, as I said before, any company, any university, any state around the world now, right, knows that Israel is likely committing genocide. So the isolation of Israel, and I hope that we'll also be seeing more and more calls for direct cutting of ties with Israel, academic boycotts uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, so while the U.S. state will definitely try, you know, to ignore uh, the ruling, uh, and we already see the headline in the New York Times today, right now, by the way, if, if uh, people are following, right, which, which frames this as the court did not issue an order for ceasefire, right? Which, which in effect it actually did, because if it's, you know, as, as Professor Mamdani said, if it ordered, right, that Israel should cease from genocidal acts, if it ordered that Israel should facilitate the entry of humanitarian aid, it actually said you have to cease fire, because otherwise there's no ways of doing that, right? So the, I think that the U.S., if to judge by the New York Times right now, will try to ignore this uh, uh, as much as possible, but I think that the pressure is going to be we're just at the beginning of the pressure building uh, up on this issue. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, we might see some significant moves uh, uh, on this front as well. The court case you're referring to in Oakland today, uh, which will be fueled by the International Court of Justice um, uh, response from The Hague, the Center for Constitutional Rights brought the lawsuit against President Biden, accusing him of failing to follow his obligations under international and U.S. law to prevent the ge genocide in Gaza. The complaint brought on behalf of Palestinians, including residents of Gaza, um, <clears throat> who are asking a federal court uh, asking a federal court to—let's see if I can read this—a um, federal court to intervene, uh, to block Biden, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin from providing further military funding, arms and diplomatic support to Israel. Catherine Gallagher, a senior attorney for the Center of Constitutional Rights and one of the lawyers who brought the case, said in a statement, the United States has a clear and binding obligation to prevent not further genocide. So far, they've failed in both their legal moral duty and considerable power to end this horror. They must do so. Now, that's the court case that's happening in a few hours in Oakland. I also wanted to read the response of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. I'm reading from an article in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper. 
He said the decision by the ICJ, quote, rightly rejected the outrageous demand to deny Israel the right to basic self-defense, to which it's entitled as a country. According to him, quote, the very claim that Israel's committing genocide against Palestinians is not just false, it's outrageous, and the court's willingness to discuss it at all is a mark of disgrace that will not be erased for generations. I want to go back to Professor Mamdani, but first, play more of the uh, court decision, as read out by the chief judge of the International Court of Justice, Joan Donahue. During the ongoing conflict, senior United Nations officials have repeatedly called attention to the risk of further deterioration of conditions in the Gaza Strip. The court takes note, for instance, of the letter dated 6 December 2023, whereby the Secretary General of the United Nations brought the following information to the attention of the Security Council. I quote, the health care system in Gaza is collapsing. Nowhere is safe in Gaza. Amid constant bombarding by the Israel Defense Forces and without shelter or the essentials to survive, I expect public order to break to completely break down soon due to the desperate conditions rendering even limited humanitarian assistance impossible. An even worse situation could unfold, including epidemic diseases and increased pressure for mass displacement into neighboring countries. We are facing a severe risk of collapse of the humanitarian system. The situation is fast deteriorating into a ca catastrophe with potentially irreversible implications for Palestinians as a whole and for peace and security in the reason, region. Such an outcome must be avoided at all costs." End of quote. On 5 January 2024, the Secretary General wrote again to the Security Council, providing an update on the situation in the Gaza Strip and observing that, I quote, sadly, devastating levels of death and destruction continue, end of quote. The court also takes note of the 17 January 2024 statement issued by the UNRWA Commissioner General upon return from his fourth visit to the Gaza Strip since the beginning of the current conflict in Gaza. I quote, every time I visit Gaza, I witness how people have sunk further into despair with the struggle for survival consuming every hour, end of quote. The court considers that the civilian population in the Gaza Strip remains extremely vulnerable. It recalls that the military operation conducted by Israel after 7 October 2023 has resulted inter alia in tens of thousands of deaths and injuries and the destruction of homes, schools, medical facilities, and other vital infrastructure, as well as displacement on a massive scale. The court notes that the operation is ongoing and that the Prime Minister of Israel announced on 18 January 2024 that the war, I quote, will take many more long months, end of quote. At present, many Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating. The World Health Organization has estimated that 15% of the women giving birth in Gaza Strip are likely to experience complications and indicates that maternal and newborn death rates are expected to increase due to the lack of access to medical care. In these circumstances, the court considers that the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip is at serious risk of deteriorating further before the court renders its final judgment. The court recalls Israel's statement that it has taken certain steps to address and alleviate the conditions faced by the population in the Gaza Strip. The court further notes that the Attorney General of Israel recently stated that a call for intentional harm to civilians may amount to a criminal offense, including that of incitement, and that several such cases are being examined by Israeli law enforcement authorities. While such steps are to be encouraged, they are insufficient to remove the risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused before the court issues its final decision in the case. Jo Joan Donahue is the chief judge of the International Court of Justice.
the UN's highest court, reading out the decision of the ICJ at The Hague. 